Have you ever wondered if you could just refuse to feel the way you normally would feel? That's what we'll talk about today. The best way out is always through. Robert Frost. Today we're going to talk about the book, How to Stubbornly Refuse to Make Yourself Miserable, About Anything, parentheses, yes, anything, by Albert Ellis, Ph.D., He's the fellow who founded the Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, and this book was long, and it was interesting because there's all sorts of examples of how you go through this process. And he said that there's other methods out there to try to combat bad feelings, bad emotions, bad thoughts, things that get you into the rut all the time. And it has a lot to do with just accepting yourself unconditionally or Just letting your feelings and emotions sit there and you can dwell with them and think about them. But the question is, is how effective is it that we have all these ineffective ways of dealing with our emotions? So when he creates this rationally motive behavior, he started it in 1955. And it's to help people feel like they can cope with, that they can control strong emotions, strong feelings that you have, and that this is science-based, and it will help you combat those feelings and feel better on a daily basis. He said that this book is just going to help you feel like you can combat being miserable. And he uses a lot of exclamation points, a lot of question marks in his book, and he says, really? Honestly? Yes. It does work. And If you'll do the listening and you do the hard work at receiving and then using all the things your brain is trying to tell you, you will actually combat these miserable, unhappy feelings. He says the problem is is that when we make ourselves anxious, we make ourselves depressed, we're acting against our own behavior. It's not helpful to us. It's not helpful to our goals. It's not helpful to our daily lives to create bad feelings, bad emotions, and then unconsciously choose them to make us feel and act in a certain way. I talked about this a little bit before when my dad would love to come home and just push my mom's buttons. He can try to make you feel in a certain way, but you don't have to feel those ways. That was all advice I got from Wayne Dyer when he talked about your erroneous zones in his book. You can combat the things you're feeling or even the things that other people try to make you feel by taking control of your emotions. And this is an adaptation onto that. That is taking it from there and going beyond it. This fellow was a pioneer in trying to do this. Says that we're not born with very specific feelings or thoughts, that our environment doesn't make us feel these ways, that there are certainly certain habits or actions that we do that make it hard for us to change some of our feelings and emotions. And Yet sometimes we do it. We can choose ourselves. We can choose to go away from these bad feelings, actions, and emotions. We have, he says, the ability to think. You know, monkeys and dogs and kittens, they don't have the ability to think in the way that we can think. We're philosophizers. We're reasoners. We're thinkers. And that makes us incredibly poised to go about changing the way we feel about things that we can choose to feel differently about them. And he says that the more we choose our methods, our ways of thinking about things, we'll get better and better at it. We will gain more free will, more self-control. We'll be able to control our emotions and even control the goals and feelings we work towards. It will make us healthier and it will take a lot of the disturbed, angry, feelings that we get pent up inside and release them so we can actually go towards something good in our lives. He says that sometimes when we're being overwhelmed by our feelings, it's what he calls awfulizing, even panicking or dread. And he says it's even worse. We get what he calls masturbation, where we must do this and we must do that. And we just drive ourselves into the hole with all the shoulds and demands and musts. And these commands He said to sneak into our brain. They just get into there where we like, oh, I really must do this. I really have to do this. I really should do this. And once we get those negative feelings in with all the shoulds and musts that we feel like we have to do, 
then it can just go about depressing us, making us miserable, making us unhappy, and making it even harder for us to get any of the goals we want. We may even get depressed about what it is. I've even been thinking, too, that I've been spending money a little bit freely, and I found myself kind of falling into this rut of, oh, now the economy is turning down a bit. I should have been saving more money. I should have been focused more. I should have been really more careful about what I bought. You know what? First of all, maybe that's true. Probably is. It doesn't do any good right now. I can't do anything about it. Am I going to go back and return all the things that I bought in the last couple of years because I felt like I should save more money? It's just this bad, stupid, negative feeling that's not something we should be putting on ourselves. That must and that should and I wish and I should have and why didn't I is just going about and inventing this negative emotion in us. And this is the type of emotion he wants us to tackle. He says it's important that we never go into this place where we're creating unrealistic demands on us, that we never insist on things that just are impossible. I need to just never spend another dime, you know? And if you said that to yourself, that's ridiculous. Of course you're going to spend another dime. Or I should never eat cake again. Or I should never do this, you know? And once you start having these weird, strong statements that you're giving to yourself, it's ridiculous. It's not going to work. It's not going to make you better. And it's just going to make you feel miserable the very first time you fall off the wagon with it. He says that it's more important for us to say, I would like if I would do this. I would prefer if I do this and even end with, and if I don't, I'm not going to die. I could be happy and really put it in its place. Are you going to die if you eat another cake? No. Instead of smacking ourselves with these statements, chances are we're going to be okay. We're still going to be happy. The thing about it is, and the thought that crossed my mind, is the reason that all of these bad statements, these musts and shoulds and demands are so bad on us is that, first of all, we're just beating ourselves up. We're not treating ourselves very well. And then it doesn't help. When you sit there and say, I am just never going to eat dessert again. I'm going to lose 10 pounds. It doesn't really work. You don't really get there. Using these kind of demands that you place on yourselves, and then you just feel bad about it. It makes you anxious and it makes you feel mad towards yourselves. It makes you feel like you're inferior. And then you just don't get the types of demands you want. So now you've just made yourself feel worse. The next time you see a cake or you see something you want to buy, it's even more unlikely that you're going to do the thing you want to do because now you just made yourself feel terrible about it. So why continue to do something that just blatantly doesn't work? And how can we get out of those ruts that we're in about making these demands on us. It is coming from your brain. You can't do something right or you must do something right. It's all from inside. And he says that we can choose to stop it and to stop making these insisting demands on ourselves. And he gives credit to a fellow named George Kelly, who was a psychologist in 1955, who said that we are like little scientists in our lives, that we can actually predict what we're going to do we're going to uphold these hypotheses, these facts. We know exactly what it is that makes ourselves tick. We try things. You know, we learn throughout our entire lives about what works and what doesn't work because we realize that at some point we have to do certain things, right? I have to get up and go to work in the morning. I have to pay my bills. I have to get my taxes done. So in the end, we are little scientists and we know what it takes to get ourselves to do something. The weird thing about it is, When we go through these bad feelings, these bad emotions, these bad statements, we know it doesn't work, yet we still do it anyway. And so the idea is that we have to stop doing it. And if you find when you're experimenting in your natural science environment of your mind that something doesn't work, why do you keep doing it? It just seems that we have to stop with the things that don't work. And he says in the end, this is about us learning, being our little scientists, about what the best methods are, about the true things that we can say, the reality of situations. He says that science, even when we're being a little scientist in our own life, is using facts and logic to either, quote, verify or falsify a theory. So if we know something doesn't work, we know it never works. It makes us feel terrible. And then we can start working on ways to find out actually what does work with us 
How do we motivate ourselves to get something done? Some things that we don't even like doing, perhaps. It's important that we figure those things out. He says that we'll get more ideas. We'll get what he calls useful guesses. And we'll be flexible, open-minded, and then have the better ability to find out what the truth of our situation is. He says we can keep still hoping and striving and wishing, but when we start making demands on ourselves, that's when it's gone wrong. So he hopes that we try it out, that we try the scientific method of finding the things that really work with us, that we start thinking rationally, that we stop doing the pie in the sky, you know, oh, it'll be wonderful and this will be amazing and there will be angels singing and the birds chirping. On the other side, that we don't drag this into such a dark place we know we can't get it done. Instead, we should have that middle, truthful, realistic way. So he says that the first rule of the scientific method is that we have to accept what's going on. The reality fact checks exactly what's going to happen right now. Two, that we have to figure out what the scientific laws, the theories, the hypothesis, all the different ways that we understand facts in our situation. It's important that we dig in a little deep to figure out what the real facts are. He says, three, science is flexible and not rigid, which means that we can be skeptics, we can examine and drill down deeper, and we don't have to accept anything at face value. We can look at something with a clear and realistic mind. And the last part of that is that when we get encountered with new data or new ideas, we can decide the past theories are wrong or maybe adjust them a little bit. He says, four, science does not uphold any theories or views that can be falsified in some manner. He says that whenever you're feeling anxious you're um, upset with yourself, you're getting down on yourself, you're avoiding what it is you need to do, you're acting in a very harmful way towards yourself, that's when you really need to start tackling these beliefs with that science. You have to think, wait a minute. Now, if I'm just getting down on myself because I should have been saving money and I didn't save money and now I feel like I threw myself into a hole, first of all, is that realistic? No, not really, probably not. You know, maybe you spent a little bit more than you should, but chances are it's recoverable. Or maybe you did, maybe you blew it, but you know what? You can't do anything about it now. So the logical, realistic belief is what can I do now? What can I do going forward? How can I improve things? How can I do better next time? How can I put guardrails up in place so I don't follow down that same pathway again? If I'm trying to avoid eating cake, How can I make it so that I am not in a place where there's cake? Example is I put guardrails on my grocery shopping. There's a corner of my grocery store. There's all the cookies, all the cakes, all the pies, everything you could possibly want to eat. And what I do, I don't even go there. I cut that corner completely off. I hang out over by the cheese and I make it over to the meats. And if I do that, I'll never even see that horrible, awful corner. Not denying myself. I'm not yelling at myself. I'm not dredging up emotion. I'm using a path to keep myself from doing something. He even talks about it when it comes to like emotions and family dynamics. If you got to this place, and he gives this example of a person who just craves their father's love, they never got it. They never got their father to appreciate them or think well of them. And it haunts them. The question is, is now you have to go and tackle this belief and burn it out of your soul, basically. You have to analyze it. Does your father's opinion still matter? Probably not. There's no reason why any grown adult should have to worry about their father's opinion. Be nice. Wouldn't it be lovely if our fathers appreciated us? But if they didn't, they didn't. Wouldn't it be nice if This other person at work liked us and they don't. Oh, yeah, maybe nice, but that's the end of it. It's not where you have to beat yourself up about it. We have to get away from sabotaging ourselves. It's one thing, if it's true, that our fathers didn't appreciate us. Okay, fine. It's another thing if you let that haunt you. If you bring that up, I never really could match up. My father always said I'd be nothing. My father always said I'd never, you know. And keep doing this to yourself. It's not your father there sitting there doing this to you. It's you doing it to you. 
and you have to stop. I don't think I ever fell quite into this rut, but I had a pretty critical grandmother at times. And she would always get on my case about my weight, about the fact that I haven't met the right man, about the fact that I haven't become a doctor yet, and really kind of drilled into me quite a bit. And I think because of Wayne Dyer and I think because of other tactics like this, I tackled those emotions. Would it be nice if my grandmother were proud of me? Absolutely. But you know what? You're not going to make everybody proud. It's just not the way life works. People are going to disagree with you. And I got to some sort of peace with it that either I was going to do what she demanded of me, which I was not going to, or I give up on that emotion and I root it out of me because it's just a pathway to disaster. So this is where he really talks about exploring your likes, your dislikes, coming up with your own viewpoint. He says, quote, you make yourself needlessly and neurotically miserable by strongly holding absolutist, irrational beliefs, IBs, especially rigidly believing unconditional shoulds, oughts, and musts. And that's where he's talking about tackling it, that we have to get rid of the musts, even like the hidden musts. And he talks about the hidden musts as I will be a failure in life if I don't meet that perfect other person. It means I'm probably unlovable. It doesn't mean you're unlovable. And it doesn't mean that your life is over if you don't meet them. You have to go after those feelings. And even if they're blatant, oh, I'm just awful if I eat this piece of cake. No, you're not awful. People eat cake. It happens. Or his example of the hidden one where you're clearly believing that if I don't make X amount of dollars by this date, or if I never move away from this town, I'm just a miserable failure. Those are some hidden musts that you've placed on your life. And you just have to get over it. He says that we have to stop overreacting to these awful past events, these past experiences, these past emotions, and just move on with it. And instead of dredging up the past and dredging up things that don't matter anymore, You have to go and and react to the things that are actually on the ground. You have to actually go and do the things that are physically in front of you. Not because this image you have of what your father or your grandmother thought of you, not because of these shoulds you think you have to do in your life, but if you do the next right thing, the next best action that you can take, and you Go after these irrational beliefs. You can then just act what's on the ground in front of you right now. Maybe you're going to eat that next piece of cake, or maybe you're going to avoid it. But until you get rid of this ghost haunting you of bad emotions, you're never going to get free of it. And to be honest, I've had that situation where there have been things I've been just addicted to, like the cake example, that you just feel like you should Or this feeling that, you know, someone's going to be disappointed in you. And the nice thing is, is once you start challenging those emotions and start challenging those beliefs, I think it's what I was trying to tell my mom. If you just sit there and say, this jerk who's yelling at me is just trying to make me feel bad. Won't he feel more miserable if he figures out it doesn't work? And once he figures out it doesn't work, he'll stop doing it probably. Because people do things because it works. And when you take that power away from them, it tends to go away. I think that's the same way it works in our brain. As soon as our brain realizes that these shoulds and musts and all these oughts that we have, he says, and these bad thoughts and these things we terrorize ourselves with stop working and we start coming up with different pathways, now we're free. And now we can start going after all the things that we're trying to do. He says some questions that you can ask yourself when you're dealing with irrational thinking is, where's the evidence that this thing is true? Or why must I have my grandmother's approval or what I think my grandmother's approval would be? Or where is it written that if I don't do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to be a miserable person? Most of the time, we don't have evidence of that. You know, we don't think that those things are actually true when we tell ourselves in the deepest layers of night, awful things. I mean, that's why it actually works on us with our unconscious mind, because there is no evidence of it. When we have these terrible thoughts, or we wonder why people at work don't treat us fairly, 
and we have to do something to make them like us. You know, none of that is true. Your life does not have to be miserable. If there's people at work who are treating you unfairly, see if there are ways that you can avoid them, avoid the negative feeling, maybe even get another job. There's no way that you have to deal with them and deal with the bad emotions that are being dredged up in your brain from them. He says that you always should remember that you have a goal and then you have this activating event. Maybe something goes poorly and then you get that irrational belief where you start beating yourself up. Oh, I'm just so awful. I'm never going to find another job. Really? You think you're never going to find another job? And then you tackle that because, of course, you're going to find another job. No matter what you say, it's going to happen. Might not be this job, might not be this situation, but you will find another job. He says that you have to look at the consequences of holding these irrational beliefs because if you keep doing this to yourself, you're going to end up feeling terrible. You might end up shortening your life because it's so damaging to your health to just be negative with yourself all the time. And that's where you're going to start fighting with these types of feelings and emotions and thoughts. You're going to come up with a new philosophy. You know what? It's okay if I eat this piece of cake, but I'm going to try to eat cake less often. And then you start combating it. Really what it is, is in this entire book, and it is a really long book, so I can't talk about all the examples, is that you start fighting against it. He gives the example of someone saying, I won't be able to look myself in the mirror. I won't be able to go on another day if I don't get this job. And he says, ask yourself, prove yourself that you can't stand it. Prove that you won't look at yourself in the same light anymore. And then the new philosophy would be, quote, I can't prove that because I obviously can stand it. I obviously will not die. I obviously can find another job because this is not the last job on the planet. And I will be able to make myself happy in a different situation. I think it's a really interesting tactic. And really where you want to read this book is if you're looking for these examples of where you're going to fight yourself, where you're going to stop these irrational beliefs, stop these thoughts that you have going on inside of you and start confronting them. And he says that if we do this, we'll change our thoughts, we'll find practical solutions and emotions to our problems, and we'll be able to then go forward and have our goals reached, have our feelings maintained, get rid of this awfulizing that he says that we do and stop making ourselves miserable. So my challenge to you is try to start small. Try to look at one thing that is making you miserable, maybe on a small scale. What is something that you do that just drives you up the wall? And can you start by looking at what's going on, listening to the messages you're telling yourself, maybe even writing them down and then tackling them? Really? If I eat that extra piece of cake, I may never be happy. I'll never find a spouse. I'll never get thin. Next step, I must. I must stop eating cake. I should not do that. I should do this and get rid of the shoulds. But instead, give that natural science inside your brain a chance to fight these irrational beliefs using logic and facts. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. I hope you have a fantastic week. And just remember that you can tackle all the negative emotions in your life by taking small steps. 